So we looks like we're recording here. Uh, so what I'll do is I will share my screen and we can get her started. All right. And can everyone see my screen okay? Yes, sir. Uh, nope. Uh, all right. Good. Yourself? Not to be in. Good. Not to be in. I mean, uh, I think we got a little bit of a. Yeah, uh, shoot. I mean, and make sure we're, we're isolated enough here that that. Uh, make sure we get here. We're isolated enough that we're. Um, yeah, but yeah, we're, we have a case now. Oh, do they? Yeah. So well, I thought. Yeah, I meant. Yeah. There we are. Um. So can we try this again? Can you guys see this screen? Okay. Yeah, I can see it, Robin. Yep, you're up and running. All right. All right, perfect. All right, cool. All right, so we'll go ahead and get started here. Uh, so as I mentioned, uh, DTN, uh, we're kind of working with uh, Mid Plains to get a, a network of traps and weather out there. And with this data, it's going to push into these tools that's going to better give you guys uh, the ability to make decisions in that in the field um, to help increase yield and, and decrease. Uh, the cost of inputs and cost of chemical um, that you may have to make in the field uh, during the season. So just a quick little um, overview uh, of DTN on our on our weather and trap side. So on our weather side, um, the last five or so years, we've become the largest commercial weather company in the world. Um, we have about 70,000 uh, plus observation points in the in the world. 45 of those. Um, our agronomic um, on-farm weather stations, so it's collecting um, agricultural pipe information, ET, soil moisture, um, humidity, stuff like that, that um, obviously the agriculture sector really cares about. And this data is QA'd. It's monitored by our MedOps team up in Minneapolis. Uh, we have about 220 or so uh, meteorologists that is looking at this data. Um, and pushing out actual uh, insights and uh, this decision-making tool or decision-making insights that you guys can take and uh, make decisions off of um, in your specific field. The specific weather station we use is a Vantage Pro, uh, Davis Vantage Pro 2. And again, it collects all this uh, agronomic type uh, information that you guys might care about. Uh, the temperature, humidity, um, Wind, wind speed, um, air pressure, soil radiation, stuff like that, that obviously you care about, this is pulling in and, and giving you um, access to that kind of data. The smart trap, um, it's not like a regular uh, run-of-the-mill sticky trap. It's an actual um, electronic trap that's going to give you insect uh, readings daily, um, so you can see uh, when an issue becomes an issue earlier than uh, the the manual way uh, a lot of people do it. And this is kind of a look at what that trap looks like. Again, it's collected to or it's uh, connected to the cellular uh, towers. So um, every day at about 6 a.m. or so, depending on uh, when the setup is, uh, when the settings are set up for it, it'll give you a, a daily count of a specific insect that you are looking for and see it allows you to see when an issue is arising based on a snapshot of this uh with this trap so here's kind of a look uh, of what i'm meaning by that so it's it's still going to pull off of a pheromone lure <clears throat> but with our algorithms that we have in place in our traps and in our tools it's actually looking for a specific trap a or specific insect, the target insect, and it's going to give you counts based on that insect. So if you look over here, um, this pheromone is, is looking for a specific insect. There's these new ones that have been identified, but they're not specifically what the target insect is for. So it's not going to give you in a, a reading um, or a account for those insects because you're not caring for those. Over here, this lure is looking for uh looks like this moth um 
And so it's going to give you a, a count. So uh, on this last day, it gives you one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, about thirteen uh, additional insects. So on your tool, you're going to see a, a there's thirteen additional insects on this trap um, from the last twenty four hours, and that's going to give you a good uh, idea of hey, this issue is becoming an issue now. Um, and then that's where you go and go. Okay, now I got to make a decision on. Uh, taking care of this problem, otherwise it's going to um, take care of my or hurt my field pretty bad. <clears throat> now the tool itself, uh, it, it's you can get it on your computer, you can get it on your tablet, your phone, and it's going to give you access to those specific day-by-day -day trap readings. So I can see the the new insects, the <clears throat> um. The old insects, you can kind of see the whole uh, lure, the whole trap, uh, what's going on in that specific trap. And then I can look at a, uh, a chart. So day by day, the readings, what's happened. So I can get a kind of a trend of where the um, insect issue is going. And I can look at a, a field, a, a geographical field uh, based on my uh, it, it based in my computer or my tablet, I can look at my field and where the uh, specific trap is and see the count of that trap. And again, give me a, a better idea of where the issue is arising at. And then you go even more in depth with it. I can get these uh, phenology models that give me a little bit more of a insight to where the, <clears throat> where the issue is arising and what I need to do based on that. And, and Chad, Chad's a, uh, Chad, if you wanna jump in here and, and explain this a little bit more, you're a little bit more well-versed in this, uh, this portion of it, but the, the egg and the, the egg hatch. Yeah, so that's, that chart gives you, it gives you an idea um, for the best timing for application. Um, a lot of our phenology models are tailored to specialty crops. Uh, we do have some phenology for uh, row crop species like the western bean cutworm. Um, that's a question I was wondering, do any of you on the call um, have an issue with western bean cutworm or have you found found that, that worm in your corn or, or your soybeans in the past? Okay. And I won't tell you anything y'all don't know, but the reason we really focus on the western bean cutworm with a, a specific model, um, the western bean cutworm is non-cannibalistic. Uh, most other uh, earworms and such will eat one another or, or kill the other worms that, that appear on pods or on the ear corn. And you might end up with you know, minimal uh, worms. With the western bean cutworm, they, they don't do that. And so uh, you can end up with more uh, on the on pods or in the, in the ear corn. It causes more damage. And so we, we have a model specifically for the western bean cutworm. When you're trapping and, and everything that Riven just mentioned about monitoring the daily counts and, and seeing the activity in the field, we can run a model that will help prioritize those fields that are most susceptible to the western bean cutworm, and it'll kind of help you focus on areas or the fields where you want to pay uh, attention to. And typically what, what we do when we're trapping is when you see activity, like in that last slide Robin showed us where we're catching 12 or 13 a day, that might that that might generate the need to go out and do some scouting in the field, and so the software that that uh, you'd have available um, will give you tools for that as well to keep uh, track and make observations uh, while you're out uh, looking uh, for the potential you know damage out in the field. And the uh, the counts, yeah, yeah. Hey, it's Jason. Uh, just real quick on uh, the western bean cutworm or any of the supported insects that we currently monitor uh, with the data algorithms uh, with the uh, smart trap. We also have, and I can probably show a little bit later, 
but we do have a way that you can you can actually set the threshold uh, of what how thick of an invasion is, is going to affect your field that will alert you and your customers when to go out and take action and extra steps. Uh, that does have an economic impact yeah. on the field. So there's a way to toggle that based on the target insect. Western bean cutworm may be uh, one to twenty uh, as everything's fine or what have you. So um, there's a way to kind of process this and, and do this in a way that is more specific to the insect and your needs and your customer needs. So anyway, okay, keep on. Yeah, great, great point, uh, Jason. That alerting tool is another is another uh, resource that we created to just help show and alert you that something's going on uh, according to the thresholds that you might set. Uh, the last thing, Robin, I'll mention real quick um, yeah. in that visual that, that you had on that on that sticky card. Um, oh, the sticky card, yeah. You, you, yeah, we, you notice some red and green squares on there. The, when, whenever you deploy a trap and it's out in the field and active, the pheromone, uh, you tell the AP software what species you're tracking. Jason will go further in depth on that after a while. Um, <clears throat> it knows the pheromone that's in the trap. It, it's putting out that uh, pheromone for that species you're looking for. The software knows because we tell it what species you're trapping. The machine learning algorithms that Riven mentioned, Jason mentioned, that come in, we can identify, the camera can identify the species uh, according to that. That's how you get the counts that come in. Each day, if you were to catch something, that particular day, it's denoted by a green square. So you can, at a visual glimpse, you can see by the notations of the green squares how many counts you had that day. The, the following day, you might catch some more that following day. And as you look at the image, the previous day's catches will be denoted by red squares. And the red squares, it, and it just what it does is it just keeps a tally each day that goes by. And for each new day, you'll be able to quickly see by the visualization of the green squares around those how many were caught that day. But we're also delivering back the count like Ryan showed you as well. Yep. Yeah. So very effective. I'll, I'll be quiet, Ryan. Uh, Ryan, I'll let you go on. No, you're good. Uh, no, you're good. You're good. Uh, feel free to jump in whenever you, you want to. Uh, okay. Uh, so I'll I'll try to jump into this this next part. So I, I know Ch Chad mentioned the uh, western bean cut uh, western bean cutworm, uh, but this is one of our uh, Midwestern uh, companies that, that want to give a case study. Um, so I mean, kind of the challenges they were having is they were getting um, about 10, 15 uh, bushels per acre if uncontrolled they're going to lose their, their bushel. So that, that specific insect is giving them a, a reduction in yield by 10 to 15 acres uh, bushels per acre. And it also exposes it to, to mold, uh, resulting in obviously some fields or some uh, fees at the elevator. So the benefits of then getting this tool is they're going to get a, an alert or a, um, a, a knowledge of, hey, this is an issue about four to six days uh, before um, the normal publicly available resources would give you. So you're going to be active on this issue way beforehand um, before uh, with whatever you have publicly available. And then <clears throat> also with some of our um, AI uh, models, uh, it's going to give you some um, idea of specific fields uh, on which which specific fields are at the highest risk and I'll kind of show you that um, right here and Jason will go go into this a little bit more but as you can kind of see um, in, in this notification and Chad mentioned this as well um, you can get notifications you can get um, alerts on when issues are arising and then you can also see okay which which issues are um, the highest issue and which fields are um, have the highest risk so you can see this uh, northern corn leaf lot is at a high risk for this uh, next door my farm field. Um, you can kind of see in this uh, Greg's house my farm field um, the gray leaf spot 
is at a moderate risk for this specific uh, issue for gray leaf spot. So again, you're going to get knowledge of when issues are becoming issues in your field while uh, getting a, a notification daily or whenever you need to get that notification um, or when it becomes an issue to your email box uh, on your phone or on, a, on the website in your account to see, uh, see these specific issues. Now, uh, again, uh, on the phone, it's going to give you an idea of, okay, this is where my fields are. These are the issues that are in the field. Um, and this is kind of the economic impact of me making a decision. So if I have this issue, if I make this decision to put a chemical application down, based on that, the estimated uh, profit would be, say, six, $604 um, for the specific uh, application. And if I don't, I'm going to lose about $2,700. And this is based on uh, some just general, um, it's pulling in, obviously, the market futures. Um, so it kind of give you a general idea of where the market is and then kind of some general prices for, for chemical. So I can kind of see if I'm profitable or if I'm not profitable by taking action on this field. Now, if I decide to take action on this field, that's where the weather side is going to come into play. So obviously, I need to say I need to make an act, take an action on this field because this issue is over, overrun my field. Now I got to put some chemical down. Now, as everyone knows, that, that comes into a, a risk of inversion. You, you have dicamba, which is a, a whole nother story of last few years. It's been a, a uh, thorn in a lot of people's sides on, on when I can put it down. If I put it down in the wrong time, um, there's a potential risk of inversion. There's potential risk of me me putting uh, the application. It, it's spreading out to someone else's field and causing them some harm. Um, and my field not even getting the chemical that I needed. Um, so that becomes an issue. So we, we've obviously took into those factors of uh, the humidity, the wind speed, the uh, temperature, stuff like that, that obviously go into a, a inversion um, calculator. And then it gives you a forecast, not day by day, not just field by field, but uh, day by day, hour by hour. So you can see, okay, on, on September 29th, I can go ahead and spray in these fields at 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock. That's my window to go ahead and put application down. Um, and, and I'm not going to have to worry about it inverting to another field. Now, and I'll kind of go into that in here in a second. Um, but with the weather side, I'm not just going to get that spray tool, but I'm also going to get some measurements in my field so I can see, okay, what are the current conditions? Uh, what's the, um, how much moisture do I have? What's the precipitation um, in my field since, um, since the start of the season, uh, this whole month? And I can kind of see some trends, some uh, analysis on where I was last year, where I was this year. Um, if, am I above average? Am I below average? And, and then just get some general weather information on, on, a, on a forecast, what the temperature is going to be tomorrow, what the wind speed is going to be tomorrow. Um, but then going back to this, this spray outlook tool, uh, it, again, it's going to allow me to set some thresholds that I obviously go into the specific chemicals. So my wind thresholds, my temperature, um, how many hours of fasting do I need? Typically, you'd see it, the three-hour window for like dicamba, for instance. So I, I got to have a, a fast of three hours, no rainfall for that time. And then I can get an hour-by-hour hour, um, forecast for inversion, whether it's going to be a, a good time to spray or good, not a good time to spray. And so I can take that insight from my trap uh, on if I need to take action and then take action at a good time and not risk myself of wasting chemical or, um, or using it and causing it to go to someone else's field. <clears throat> That's just kind of a quick overview of what we're going to kind of be talking about in today. And Jason will take you a little bit more in depth into the tools um, and, and kind of get you going on how that would look. Do you, do you have any questions on, on what I spoke about so far? Anybody? Yeah, Ryan, do you Can I add? Yeah. yeah. What about in the yeah, area? Yeah, Rich. 
And what about in the irrigation management, uh, ET outlooks and stuff, forecasts? The irrigation management, as far as uh, I, uh, what I need to do, as far as how how much moisture I have in the field, like uh, or, or future, kind of soil moistures. Projections on future e S ET needs, or how much moisture we're going to need the next week. I believe I've seen that somewhere where you have that in the system too. Or for the next five days, we're we're going to average like quarter inch a day moisture, or three tenths of a day. Yeah. Um, Jason, do you, do you know that, that answer? I'm trying to think. I know that um, in, in lar large uh, sections of the country with uh, pivot irrigations or different types of uh, situations that uh, with our weather economic insights, it's going to be able to provide some of that uh, precipitation uh, data and uh, forecasting data and so forth. Um, I do know that our uh, product management team is actually working on some additional uh, tools that are really centered around uh, irrigation systems in terms of um, injecting uh, herbicide pesticide uh, soil and, and tissue and and so forth all of the parameters around a, an effective decision in the field uh, so that uh, hopefully will be coming out here uh, this year uh, in time for the summertime uh, Chad I don't know if you have yeah, we, yeah let me add just a little bit there we um, I want to talk about that first, then I want to add just one thing about the spray outlook might be relevant, but we we do forecast evapotranspiration and, and growing degree days out 15 days. And so you'll be able to, especially if we're using weather stations, um, it's something that we can help with on that too. Uh, the Davis weather stations, we, we have the ability uh, to uh, provide a soil moisture sensor to those as well. Uh, we're typically using the Davis drill and drop 12 inch uh, moisture probe for those. Uh, that takes a reading about every four inches that'll provide back some of that information that would be helpful to make some of those irrigation decisions. Um, and so I think we'll be able to provide, you know, the forecast even a couple days ahead up to 15 with some of those for those management decisions there. Um, one of the things I wanted to add it about on the spray outlook portion real quick and just briefly is um, down in my, I, I'm from Oklahoma, that's where I live. I do a lot of work in the mid south uh, part of the country also. And we, we have a, a large problem with dicamba down here when we're doing burn down or trying to, tr you know, treat our broadleaf plants and such. So spray outlook tool is not, not only used for planning and management, but a lot of the customers we have will use custom applicators. Some of them have their own equipment, but they'll plan ahead, order product and all the management and all the variables that go into that to look ahead to find the best application time. And if they're using a product where they, they have to be concerned about a, the risk of inversion, they can use the spray outlook to gauge down not only the best day but the hours of the day and so that's been providing benefit around the management of of uh, ordering the the product and scheduling the applicators and so it's been really uh, a resourceful tool uh, for the folks that are using it there in that in that sense and even any any of the herbicides or the the pesticides that are going out many people if they're, especially when they're keeping track of it or logging it, a lot of people still write it down. But um, when we're gauging wind speed and, and the temperature and all the things that we have to be concerned about, this just helps provide a better window uh, to keep you safe and, and others safe when you're out there doing that product. So um, the tools that we'll be talking about a little bit more in depth if you have other questions when we get to those segments, just shout them out and we'll talk through them. I'll stop right got? there, Ryan. Oh, we got, uh, all right, cool. We have some questions. All right, so Jason, if you wanna take over, I think I gave you, or yeah, there we are.
you might get a reaction. You can see the screen, so that's good. But uh, were there any yeah, questions? I can see it okay. Ivan, did you say there was a question out there? Uh, no, no, I thought there was. We're good. Okay, okay. Well, thank you, everyone. Again, my name is Jason Sims. I'm a key customer success manager, and part of my role is to uh, to initiate and, and engage with customers uh, on a, a more of a personal level in terms of uh, all of the services and products that we have within DTN to a large organization to ensure that what you're using uh, out in the field for your customers and for your team is, uh, is a fantastic return on your investment. And uh, if we have tools that uh, we currently don't have that would be maybe need to be added, um, I'm also your advocate uh, internally to go to our development team and see what uh, is maybe possible uh, to add into the system. Uh, that's a large part of what, of how this, this product of the AP has started from the days of Spencer Technologies, which is where I'm coming from uh, here in West Lafayette to uh, making this into a DTM tool as well. So um, I spend a lot of time with folks uh, kind of digging in the weeds and trying to figure out what everybody needs. But uh, so what I wanted to do is just kind of give you a, a quick overview of the uh, DTM AP um, software. And uh, I believe some have seen this possibly and some may not, but at any point, feel free to stop me and, and ask a question. Um, otherwise, uh, Chad will tell you and Ryan, and I can ramble, ramble, ramble. So just let me know where I need to maybe pause. So a couple things here, um, just like a lot of your precision software and scouting software, and I've used a lot of that in my time. I was with Monsanto and then I was also a, uh, a seed advisor and seed director for Helena Chemical here in the Midwest. And uh, a lot of the software we used sometimes was very efficient, but then there were parts of the software that were not uh, efficient. And things such as going into the field, pulling uh, soil samples, doing water tissue and, and soil sampling and so forth, uh, scouting fields. Um, it was very clunky and very difficult. And you're toggling between Excel spreadsheets and CV CSVs and so on and so forth, and it was just a very cumbersome, and uh, it took another half day to get all that information in. What I like about DTN AP is sort of a one-stop location where you can actually uh, actively engage with your customer and your team to make sure that you're uh, constantly updating uh, your pest issues. And pest would be insect weeds disease, uh, what is what we consider a pest issue. And so this is a great tool to document everything because it also will give you an opportunity to talk about the economic impact of making a decision now as opposed to later, how that can affect you uh, at the end of the year. And that way you can let your customers know, here, we're, we're here to help you out. We're here to give you that return on investment. We're here to empower you. AP is not a, uh, a terminator or a robot type of software. It's going to give you all the answers. Um, that's the last thing we want to do. What we want to do is empower you and give you the tools that you need uh, to tell your story, to tell the story to the customer about what's happening in their fields so that you can effectively go out and make those recommendations. So how this is set up is much like a lot of other software. On the far left side over here, um, we have uh, the current customers. And so this is my uh, demo account. So I have a list of customers listed over there. And we do break things down by a grower farm and field decision tree. So we have the grower, which is Bonham Farms, and the, uh, the farm location is Cashmere Acres. So it may have all of these fields that are associated with Cashmere Acres. And so uh, at this particular farm, this is what we're looking at. You can always add new fields to uh, a person's account. We have that available right here at the very bottom. Just by clicking on that, it gives you the opportunity to go in and you can actually draw in your boundaries or you can go in and use the common land units uh, that are maybe common in your neck of the woods, which is a nice uh, feature to have. Uh, you can upload uh, shape files, but also what we have is you have the ability to, uh, if you have a lot of shape files, and we've worked with some customers with uh, huge, huge files of that. At the very bottom down here, we have a bulk importer, so you can pull this up, you can actually go in and drop in all of your shape files. And it's even set up so that it will send you an email when it's done uh, uploading those fields and there's some uh, parameters in here where um, it will not duplicate uh, certain fields or give you options to kind of clean things up if you will and to go through and make sure you're all set for the season so right now this is an important part of the ap as we're in uh, the latter stages of march going into april so people are updating fields and so forth so this tool is actively being used right now 
So in terms of, of how we can use the insect um, traps, the DTM smart traps, and also some of the weather station information, there's a lot of, it, a lot of ways you can uh, utilize this information. Um, so up on the top up here, we have several options up here. We have a bell, which is the alerts. Uh, this is something that you you've set within your Delta traps, or if you're using the DTM smart trap, uh, this is a way to alert you when one, your lure has expired. Lures are typically uh, two to three weeks, depending on the potency. And uh, the lures will be happy to give you some, uh, some suggestions on the companies that uh, our customers have used for the lures. We don't provide the lures because it's, uh, it's a whole nother area. It's a biological and, and it's just kind of an area because of shelf life that we can uh, provide. But we do have some great vendors we work with. Um, so this gives you an, an opportunity to go in and update those lures. It's also um, a way that you can go in and see, um, and this is a, an old account here, but just to show you that we have a, a, an event or a risk of rarely spot in the field. So it'll give you an opportunity by clicking on that. It'll take you directly to the field, and then you can make observations on that and see what kind of uh, uh, notes that you have in there based on that scouting trip. The alerts is also set up for uh, just about anything that you need. So you can actually go in and, and toggle this back and forth and you can set up what type of alerts are going out. Uh, this can be highly effective, or if you're like me, um, I do sign up for newsletters and so forth, but after a while I get tired of getting the same type of email over and over. And so the customers may say, look, I'm good to go. I think we're doing all right. You can always pause those alerts by just toggling them on and off in terms of what they want to see and when, and then you can set those parameters. So uh, this is an automatic way because we all get busy at multiple customers. This is a good way to make sure that uh, all, all of the issues that are in the field are being documented and sent to somebody so that they know what kind of action plan they need. So we have different markers in here in terms of, of um, different types of crop uh, risk issues such as Great Leaf Spot. We also have uh, based on the dynamic phenology modeling um, that now is the time that the flights are happening around that July 26 time. So everything in here has got a little bit of a history in there so you can go back and see what's going on uh, and to set your uh, parameters and alerts um, that is best for you and your customer. Um, also at the top up here, we also have um, some other tools, the account tools, something that you can use quite a bit. So uh, this is the location where if you're the admin for your organization, you can add in uh, scouts and or temporary scouts or even interns and they give them certain parameters and permissioning that they need and you can actually uh, close one out and deactivate that user but if they come back next year you can reactivate them because it stores everything in there uh, since I have uh, one that's actually deactivated. You know, also notice that uh, we have one guy Robert Smith right here who's italicized that's actually a customer and so what I'm trying to do is give him a read-only account I just want him to be able to see what's going on, but I don't want him to go in and update any of the data and the information. Uh, so typically this is a, a good, good opportunity for a customer to use, and that's something that we can go over a little bit later, but it's a, a great way for that customer to stay engaged. Also up here we have uh, all of the growers um, in here. So based on what type of insect uh, or insight package you have, uh, whether it's the imagery, it's a growth stage, dynamic phenology and so forth, um, you can actually go in and make sure that everything is enabled uh, for that particular customer, make sure that the insights are enabled and what insights do they have in the field. So this is kind of useful in a lot of ways as an administrator. You can actually go in and give different uh, members of your team uh, different levels of insights, uh, but it's all part of the package and I'm sure uh, Ryvin and Jack can go over that as well. We also have an extensive crop library in here, um, one of the most extensive I've ever seen. Um, there are some crops in here that I didn't, didn't even know existed. And um, actually, I was talking with a customer in, uh, in Colorado, and you can imagine what he was asking for. He was asking for, you know, hemp and marijuana. So um, we have that in there as well. So um, you can actually put in your specialty crops. Uh, these are the ones that I work with quite a bit in some demos. But if I want to add a particular crop to my library, which will put it at the very top, It'll give you an opportunity to pull up just that crop and you don't have to go through all of them over and over and over. Same thing is true on the, uh, the pest. We have a large pest uh, library in there based on insect weeds and disease. So with the time allowed, I uh, just wanted to go in and just show a couple examples of, of how you can use the reporting feature to send information out to your customers, but also how you're going to interpolate and use the information 
that's on uh, the DTNAP. So first of all, I wanted to show you real quick the economic impact. I think it's a really powerful tool to use, especially in a season where uh, we're in an era right now where um, there's not a lot of wiggle room. And so we want to maximize the return on the investments out there and the customer to see that. So what I've got pulled up right here is a, a scouting event, and we're kind of going back in time just for the data and the demo data I have in here to show you. But you can see we scouted the, uh, the field here. You can see that we started right here with an observation, and you can actually see the scouting path that we took in that field. It's all of those observations, and it just quickly, quickly gives you um, an observation so you can take a look at that. But everything is stored on here, and observations are stored on here. And because of that, and when you have the economic impact um, set up, meaning you've got uh, your plant planting date, you've got uh, you know, the varieties, relative maturity, we have all those information and all those pieces in there that feeds into the growing degree you know, units and so forth. But all of that uh, encapsulates that information and lets you know, you know what, if we don't take care of this velvet leaf right now, and this is at the end of May, beginning of June, uh, there's a potential of a 3.6 bushel loss. And then we also have some calculations in here to kind of show how we came up with the bushel loss and then also what the dollar amount is also going to be based on the current assumptions. And right here, the assumptions would be on the current uh, CME pricing and how the markets are doing and so forth. So right here is- Hey, the Jason. Can, yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I'm sorry to jump in just real quick. Um, I just wanted to, just for, to make sure every, we're all in the same camp as we go through this. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of growers online with us and, and, and then uh, Mid Plains and everybody. So these are tools that each of us can use out in the field. Um, and so as you're working uh, with Rich and them in, in, in figuring out, you know, how best to utilize the information, Riven would, will help and will help, can, you know, get all this configured to where you'll have tools available to use at your at your farm you know and so all of this stuff that we're going through are things that we can as individuals you know find benefit in as we go through this so you know keep that in mind and and and, and please you know we are we like jason said earlier we are here for you guys and and we want it to be personal and if y'all have questions i mean we're here to help so just feel free to jump in and, and interrupt us and ask questions when you have them yeah, Chad, thank you. I appreciate Sorry. that. Sorry, Jason. <laughs> no, it's good. And, and I was kind of positioning this uh, from a retail standpoint, but I know we have growers on the call, and so um, didn't want to send in that direction. I do have some growers where I'm at here in West Lafayette, Indiana. We have some of the largest growers uh, in the country, and so they have a lot of investors. There's one grower in the county that has about 6,000 acres, and so there's investors in there. So this is just a way to disseminate information to uh, partners in an operation, or if it's just down to your own family farm and so forth, um, you're, you know, you're going to see a lot of this information come your way so you can make those effective decisions. And, and I'll also say on the economic impact and the spray outlook, these are tools to make sure that we're getting into the field and we're spraying for those target insects at an appropriate time. The dynamic phenology modeling on that is really important because uh, with the tools that we have available out there, uh, we have a trap here in the field and we take those trap counts. Um, it's going to go across up here on, on the bar up here. It's going to be looking at growing degree units, precipitation. Uh, it's going to show um, uh, in any kind of foliar disease opportunities out there, the weather and so forth. So there's a lot of information here that we can make it a, a, an effective decision so that we're getting in the field and we're spraying effectively to make sure we have that effective kill on a, a weed, uh, uh, an insect or what have you. So um, everything is loaded in here so that we can maximize everything we can at every single moment of the season. And it's gonna be maybe a difficult year in some areas. And so uh, this becomes a very important tool in here. Um, so let me uh, just jump over here to the traps uh, and Ivan kind of went over this as well um, in terms of what you can see out there in the fields. So with the, uh, with the insect traps out there, the automated traps, um, you can have a lot of information coming at you. And, uh, and so in this particular instance right here, uh, in this field, I've got a lot of different traps in here. I had traditional traps um, that are the sticky card that you set out in that Delta a triangle trap. And then we also have the DTM smart traps that are in that field as well that gives you a lot of information. Um, 
what you're seeing right now, you're seeing um, different colors on those traps. Those are the thresholds that we talked about earlier. And so when we look at this from, you know, maybe it's a, um, this particular insect out there, we're looking at this and saying, okay, what is that, what is that African sugarcane borer? What is that going to do to the almonds in that particular field? Just wanted to give you a different crop to look at. Uh, but you can go and set that threshold and the average per day. So this sets it just like the, uh, the military and the government you see in the movies. It's DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2, whatever it is. But I don't know about you, but when I see red, I get real, real skittish out there. And I want to make sure I'm getting to that field and make that effective decision. So you can set those parameters of what it's going to alert you and what it's going to alert the rest of your team uh, on your operation. So uh, that's just a good way to make sure that you're being alerted the way that you want to. Somebody might see it a different way as well. So let's, uh, let's look at uh, some of the traps out here. And what, what this does is, and you can have all the graphs up here uh, that you need, but what this also does, it gives you information on uh, making sure that that dynamic phenology and that modeling is happening out there. So if we're going after a particular insect, you know, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna set the biofix of when we're out there in the field and um, you know, maybe we'll go to uh, about April the 8th, we're gonna set that and we're gonna get uh, some other uh, activities in here to kind of give us an idea. But when you set that, it's gonna give you an event curve. It's gonna show you uh, essentially when the growing degree units are going up or down, uh, chill hours is something for the specialty crops, but also so it's gonna give you an opportunity to, um, to take a look at uh, different kinds, pardon me, uh, different types of insects and when they're most active in the field in those event curves. So this gives you that, that window so that you're spraying before or after, but you're spraying right in the, in the right time and effectively killing that insect because our dynamic um, uh, modeling and the data science that we put into it will actually calculate and narrow that window down so you're not spraying after the fact, after the kill, and after the damage is already done or too soon before the damage is done. So it's a really effective tool uh, to see what kind of information and, and data is actually happening in that field. So to Ryan. Hey. Yeah, Jason, yep. I'm so sorry. I'm sorry. But, um, and just to just talk about biofix and things like that. Well, um, and, I, and I'm sure I'm not saying anything we don't already know. But um, for me, when I was trying to get understanding of that and how to use it, it, it what it's really doing is it's, it's helping us to gauge the life of the insect. And, and it sort of initiates the, the beginning of the growing degree day calculations. And so we kind of base it off of that so we can just define a better timing for application. And, and Jason, correct me, driving um, or add to that, but just for you know, my purposes of understanding how our, our data, or our resources are working, it's just to get a better timing of when we can be most effective in our treatments. Yep, absolutely. And you had mentioned earlier about the adult uh, flight and egg hatch uh, time periods. All that information is in here so that you can make an effective decision, you know, based on those um, technology modeling and so forth. So it's, we're taking as much of the guesswork out of this so that we can put in um, actual insights and actual data to make those effective decisions and maybe not rely so much on, you know, the Farmer's Almanac, which I think it's a great pop publication, but uh, maybe a little bit old school. So just trying to take it to the next level out there. Um, and so Ryben mentioned earlier, um, you're gonna get uh, information in the field. And so we have one of the DTN smart traps in here, just to kind of give you a quick overview. Uh, you can name the traps anything you want. Uh, you can change that information. Uh, right here is the three dots, but that's where you're gonna see your, um, your latest poll, your latest number of insects in that field. Uh, this is a trap out of season, so it looks like it's turned off, but for the, um, demonstration purposes, I have this set up so we can look at different things. Um, you can actually go in and see um, those images, and you can also get this on your mobile device, uh, which is uh, any iPhone or um, uh, you know, iPad and so forth. Um, I will say we are working on an Android version uh, currently to bring it up to the level and the, and the status that we want that Android device to work, but we'll let you know when it's... Uh, released, but typically um, iOS is probably the best way to go in terms of the software that you're going to use. But out here on the side here, you can see we've got um, the first day's catch. We have the two green squares that identifies that uh, target insect, which is a navel orange worm. 
And then you can see on the next one right here that the two red squares is from the previous day and here's the next day count. And so it, it is actually using algorithms that our um, entomologists and our data science team have put in there to capture those insects in the field. And this is a great one to kind of show how accurate it can really be. Um, I know navel orange worm may not be in a pest in your area, but this is the, for the uh, purpose of showing you. We have the first day, we have the second day, and then here's the third day. There's three right here, but right here, we've got a common house fly. And our algorithms are noticing that that is not the markings, the identifiers that we've used to make that a positive confirmation of a navel orange worm in this case. So it won't count that. So it is giving you accurate information out there in terms of the field. Is it a silver bullet? It's gonna catch everything? No, but it is the most accurate that you can find in the industry. Um, with Western bean cutworm, uh, I've had a lot of experience with that. You'll have one or two hits a day, and next thing you know, the next day, this entire card is just covered and you don't even see the grids anymore. So uh, oftentimes that is the DEF CON 6000 to go out there and check out, check out that field. So, uh, so a lot of tools you can use to identify and then send your team out into the, into the field to check out based on those parameters. So uh, any questions on, on the uh, information you can see in real time information? Because what we can do is we can actually send out a report, and there's a lot of ways you can do this. Uh, so within the, uh, the reporting feature, um, I've got a large history back here of different uh, scouting events that I've taken uh, over the time. And so if I want to go out and make an observation uh, in a field of some uh, activity that we've seen recently, um, then I want to make sure that I'm actually getting out there and sending information to the customer, to myself, um, to whoever it may be on your team, uh, this is a way that you can share with everyone what's happening out there in the field. So you can set this up for scouting events and trap counts. We had different icons for that. Uh, so you can see a little bit of a map right here is showing some of those icons. But if I wanted to send out a report, maybe uh, sometimes I do this myself because I get forgetful all the time. So sometimes I send information to myself so I can look at it later, so I can look over the information and make decisions. Um, but this is another way that you can document your season so that at the end of the season, you can go back and see some of the event curves, some of the, uh, of the issues that were actually um, hindering decisions or maybe why the, your yield was up or down or whatever the case may be. Um, but by clicking on a particular event, I can, I can click on that. I know I want to send that out uh, to my partner. Uh, I want to send it to my crop advisor because I want him to know what I've observed in my field. Or maybe your crop advisor is sending this to you to let you know, hey, I just scattered your field and just want you to know what's happening out there. Um, you can see we did a demo. Um, you can see the table is a, a major white wall threat. Yeah. So I just had a, excuse me, hold on. Just had a guy, uh, John Ferguson just called me. He's having trouble chatting, but he had a question uh, on corn borer. We've got a lot of popcorn in this area, mm -hmm. the non BT uh, corn. Corn, corn borer can be an issue, but can you talk about corn borer for a little bit? Yeah, so, um, you know, Chad, feel free to step in at any time, but, you know, we do have, um, when it comes to our DT and Smart Trap, we, we have a list of supported species that we currently track. And I say that because in our, uh, in our development of making sure that we're positively identifying those insects, we take it through a, a regimen of, um, of clarification and, and the algorithms to make sure we're identifying that correctly. We continue to add new uh, insects as we go through the year. I just uh, was speaking with Dr. Scott Williams, our entomologist, and he's preparing to go out into the uh, fields here down the road uh, to uh, bring up some new uh, particular insects in the field. But we do have uh, some insects that we currently um, track and so forth. And, uh, you know, Chad, do you have any, uh, any background on I know on corn borer, we have a lot of issues here in Indiana and uh, in your neck of the woods out there, it's also an information or an issue. Um, we can track certain species, but it may be at the point where based on the pheromone lure and so forth. But uh, Chad, you want to speak on that? Yeah, I mean, it, it, all of it on the traps, whether it be manual or, uh, or the smart traps, is going to first depend upon whether there's a pheromone for it. and and the other important thing to know about the smart trap is 
when we target a species, we've got some we got some different um, categories of the corn borer that we have the models built for. Um, what we'll do specifically is get a, a more defined list of the different types for you um, to, to make sure we're covering it. But here's the biggest thing to remember. The, with the camera trap every day, whether we're trapping a species that we have a, uh, a model for or not. And what I, when I talk about model, um, it, the machine learning that we do up in the, our office up in West Lafayette, uh, Indiana, there at Purdue, where Jason's at, um, our entomologist in the group there, and Jason does a lot of work with them there too, but we do wind tunnel testing um, on on moths as they fly in to determine different angles that the moths are trapped at. And then as we accumulate multiple images on these species, the camera becomes smarter. The more images we collect, it becomes more smart every every time we access an image. And so whatever trap uh, position a moth is caught, we start the the algorithm becomes more fluent in being able to determine what that species is and so while we probably will have a model um, for what you're looking for in the corn borer we'll again we'll Riven and I and Jason will uh, get a, a confirmed list uh, specifically for that back to you but every day you'll still be able to have a visual image of what's being caught on those cards. And so <clears throat> I will point this out, that while you can see the image on a computer or your phone, a really great way to see the image is on an iPad because of the resolution that the iPads have. And you can zoom into a scale where you can, you can make a decision on what's being caught, probably even a little bit better than visually being out in the field because of glare and different things and the, the dust that the moths, you know, put off. The images are really clear. And so while we, we focus on the different traps, again, pheromone, we have to have a pheromone for it. We have people that will want to trap multiple species in a field at the same time. And I'll go ahead and address that real quick. When you're doing a trap, be it a manual trap, like a delta trap, Jason mentioned, or one of our smart traps, we can only have one pheromone in a trap at a time, or it will confuse uh, the purpose of, of the pheromones as they mix. What we, what we do suggest, because more, more people are wanting to trap multiple species during portions of the year, because they'll start seeing activity from them, is we'll put out two stations, no less than 10 feet apart, but usually about 15 to 20 feet apart. You can put multi, you can put different pheromones, one in either trap, and 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 that's a good way to to start trapping multiple you know species at a time. But um, the the only species today that we have a, a model for again would be that western bean cutworm because it's it doesn't really migrate and there's a whole bunch of conditions that that are conducive for that species and they're non-cannibalistic and so we focused a lot of energy on that and the list is dynamic like jason mentioned and so if we happen to come across a species that we don't have a model for but we start having demand we we start a testing phase on that and and begin that development work for it. Um, did that answer that question, or did is my still too vague? See, you got the the ECB that be European corn borer. Yep. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. um, well, yeah, we have a model for for that. Yeah, I'll call. It. John was having trouble chatting, so I'll call him back and see if he. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah. If it was... 
Yeah, and Chad, thanks for pointing it out. That was kind of the, the next stage here before I moved over just to look at the weather station. And that is right. You know, the smart trap doesn't have the ability to toggle back and forth because everything is pheromone based. But in this example here, we've got the uh, DTN smart trap here. We have other um, traps out there. So what you can do is you can put it at the head of the field so you can capture uh, the wind direction and the insects coming in. It's like a sentinel maybe on top of a, a castle parapet that's looking down saying, hey, here they come and uh, get prepared. Then it'll give you those accurate numbers. And then it correlates that with numbers that you're actually counting yourself and inputting. Uh, so a lot of different ways to look at this. Um, what's really nice is if you're, if your operation, if you have an operation that has a lot of fields spread out throughout the county or the area, you can actually from your vehicle, from your home, whatever it may be, you can actually get into your device, take a look at that trap and then see what's going on and we can discern, uh, discern uh, the information and make a decision whether you want to go out and, uh, and check that field, you certainly can. So good time saver as well. I talked to John, he said that answered his question. Uh, European corn borer and western bean are the, would be the two big insect problems in this area. Yeah, okay. uh, Chad, correct me wrong, but I, I believe Dr. Williams is actually working on those uh, for this season as well, just to kind of um, button those up and, and uh, make sure that they're really effectively tracking. So um, we're hitting just about every industry, industry you can possibly can, whether it's row crop or specialty crop. Yeah, this, this area is, um, there's a lot of livestock in this area, a lot of cattle, and then there's, the crops are, mm -hmm. are soybeans, corn, and we've got popcorn, quite a bit of popcorn in the area. Uh, it's a, mm -hmm. uh, heavily irrigated, there's a lot of sandy soil, so irrigation management mm -hmm. is, a, is a big issue in this area with the sandy soils. Hey, I want to add something real quick to that comment. Um, while we're a bit different down in Oklahoma, um, a lot of times we'll graze our wheat ground with cattle and we'll pull them off this time of the year that we're in right now. And we've seen over the past several years kind of a trend. The, the fields that we've had cattle pressure on, we, we tend to have more army worm presence. Yep. And so we're trying to, you know, figure out um, if that's really the cause of it or not. This past year, we, we had to replant a couple of fields because we got army worms that moved in overnight. I realize not everybody grazes their wheat, but that was something that was just kind of a common thing that we saw down here that we had fields that we had cattle on. We kind of had some more pressure with the fall army worm down here. And we also hit the uh, army cut worm, black cut worm, uh, filbert worm, and, and so forth. Or so um, and corn earworms. So we are uh, continuing to add to that list and so forth based on uh, targets and, and uh, the current commodities and prices and so forth. Um, but as as Ryan mentioned, we've got some of the most powerful weather station networks in in the, uh, the world out there. And so on DTNAP and also on your mobile device, um, you can see that this is somewhat new uh, this year. So we're really excited about having this available. Uh, it's going to tag into your local. Uh, weather stations and just by clicking on that you're going to be able to see a lot of the information that as it appears to be important in the area and I know Indianapolis isn't a, a big um, area for cattle or, or uh, for growing but just for the purposes um, I can pull from different weather stations out there to see the current conditions uh, what's going to precipitation amounts the forecast spray outlook and everything so um, just a great tool to be able to have out here uh, especially when we get into the planning season and then pre plan and post plan emergence and so forth. Um, but the weather stations are popular. Hey, hey, Jason, let me add something just real quick concerning the European corn borer and the Western bean cutworm. Just some stats from last year. We had put out um, for the European corn borer, we had 35 traps deployed focusing on that. And out of those 35 traps, we had 762 images that we collected. And, and then on the Western bean cutworm, we had put out 32 traps focusing on it. And we collected 780 images off of those traps. And so we were able to distinguish um, the, the activity in the field very, very accurately last year. Um, just 
since we brought up those two species, I just wanted to throw that out because it was very effective. Thanks, Chad. You took my thunder, man. I love throwing yeah. those numbers. <laughs> I, I know you, you do. And I, I had to jump in there before you did. <laughs> I'll, give it, I'll give it to you, man. I'll give it to you. Um, but yeah, that, that is correct. You know, we do some very extensive training or, or trap training in terms of um, uh, the algorithms out there and just to get that information plugged in so you can make those most important decisions. So we're constantly out there verifying and, and testing and uh, have a great team on that. But, uh, you know, I don't know how we're doing on time, but, uh, you know, that's kind of an overview of the, of the traps and sending out reports. Um, there's a lot more involved in the AP. We go into the first, but uh, you know, moving forward, uh, myself and other members of the team, uh, we do a lot of onboard training. And so, what we can do is just up on a call. We can pull up a team. We can go through and help you get field set up, uh, the door farm and field type of setup, and and everything else. If you have BT Smart Traps, we can actually get out there, and we can also have you uh, ready to go with that as well. By you know, I'm talking about adding some traps out here. Um, you know, when you're in that field, you can add traps at any point. A way to do that in terms of uh, are you putting out a delta trap, which would be a traditional trap. And you can see I've added two right here. When I move it, the GPS coordinates follow it. And you can move it at any point. Then if you have a DT and smart trap, this is not the, the notice you're going to get. You won't get this. But what you will get is a drop down menu that has the trap identifier. So typically, on our traps, they have uh, AF00432, or you name it a trap. And so um, all the traps that are assigned to your account go into your field. Nobody else outside of your account can actually uh, take that trap information. So it's only localized to you and who you uh, want to share it with. So um, I guess uh, an effective way to uh, keep uh, folks from uh, stealing data, I guess, uh, if you will. But. Uh, but all of that is loaded in here, and then you can also export a lot of the data in here in terms of uh, the insect uh, pressure, uh, weed pressure, and so forth, and you can export different types of reports based on uh, what you're looking for in that uh, activity. Hey, Jason. Go for it. Could, do, do you have a field where you have some economic impact analysis on that we could walk through? Yes. A little, well, I know we did it a little bit earlier, but I just thought we might take one more glance at that. Yeah, absolutely. So in this particular field right here, uh, it's a soybean a field. And again, as you, you may recall from earlier, that uh, shows a scouting path out here. And so we're going out and you're making those observations. Our mobile device, um, it will ask you a series of questions. And I think, you know, Chad and Robin would tell you what you put into it is what you get out of it. So. Um, I worked with a, a retail uh, location up in Canada this past year, and they were having some issues of getting accurate information. It turns out that their scouts were not answering all the questions. And soon, soon enough, as soon as they started answering all the questions, they started to see um, more accurate uh, input data to make those decisions. And that feeds right into that economic impact. Uh, so when you're scouting out there, it'll ask you questions of, you know, how many weeds per, you know, per foot? How many, uh, if you take a hula hoop out there and throw it out there? It's going to ask you a lot of questions. So we encourage people to, to make those questions available and put it in as, as accurate as you can. You can go back and, and update a scouting uh, trip if you need to. If you see that in that information is maybe not as correct, you can go out there and make those uh, changes. You know, one thing with uh, a foxtail, it's hard to identify <coughs> all these different versions. So um, it gives you opportunity to go out there and make sure it's accurate. Uh, but in this yeah. regard, here you can see uh, the economic impact and it's letting you know the average height five weeks per 100 square foot 4.5 of the field is damaged or infested with a velvet leaf so this is all coming from that scouting trip and making sure that we have the information we need and then this is sort of a breakdown of what you're collecting on the mobile device and more of a, a back-end type of look okay you're gonna say something there? yeah it's, yeah it, and so as you're out there like Jason's showing here and you're making an observation our our program will default to the average county yield goal but you can go in and change that relevant to your field and then we're looking at the commodity prices the current commodity prices and then the one thing that you have to add in there is the cost of your input and and by adding that information 
along by answering the questions that Jason just went over. That's what helps calculate that economic impact on whether or not you should treat that field. And so it can save a lot of money um, to let you know, okay, this it, it would be profitable to go out and make a treatment or, or it's not. That's the whole goal of that tool is to provide that that value for you. Yeah, and you can see here it's pulling from a yield target or the use case estimate, or it's pulling off of the current CME pricing on soybeans. And so that's updated through, uh, obviously DTN has a great, awesome uh, resource for the markets out there. So you're getting the most latest information out there. So yeah, it's a good point, Chad. So that, uh, <coughs> having a trip and a report that uh, you can uh, have on your record so you can see what's happening or to send it out to colleagues or what have you. But uh, there's a way to actually uh, see what's going on out there in the field. And then what you can do is you can go back out because these are somewhat GPS located. You can actually go out there to that location and do a spot check to see if that damage or that issue is continuing to be an issue or did we go out and did we knock it down uh, in time so that uh, we can save the yield out there. So um, a lot of accuracy out here in terms of getting back out to it and making those right decisions. Riven, how are we doing? I, I well, I think we're we're a little bit over time, uh, but I think we're we got a lot of information here. I, I guess we can kind of conclude here with uh, um, any questions that does anyone have any questions or additional thoughts um, around kind of what we we talked about today. A lot of information I know, but um, we'd love to get your questions if you got them. So what? If could you go a little bit into the weather data or into the weather side of it and uh, forecast using the forecast that you provide? And, and that, like I said, we're, we do a lot of irrigation and irrigation scheduling is a big issue. Yeah, Chad and, and arriving, uh, take a stab at it. I'll pull something up here to go off of. <clears throat> yeah, well, I mean, I can kind of take a, kind of a breakdown of our um, kind of our weather. So obviously we have all those weather uh, stations out there um, and, and they get um, observed. They make sure they're set up correctly and then we get good weather data. And so we have a uh, large weather uh, data sets that come in. So our meteorologists can uh, determine kind of forecast based on that. So that makes us obviously the most accurate forecaster out there. Um, <clears throat> and then from there, uh, we're able to make those precipitation uh, um, observations and those forecasts. You can kind of see uh, if I need to irrigate or if I shouldn't irrigate based on uh, our, our forecast based on um, year, year, year over to year um, measurements versus now. And I can see where my soil moisture is and I can kind of make a decision on whether I need to irrigate or not. Um, that's kind of I mean, just a quick uh, synopsis and that's kind of I mean Jason's yeah. kind of shown us the, the whole weather dashboard there but I, I'm sure you've okay. probably addressed this Robin um, something that's really cool and, and that differentiates DTN on the weather station side of it and, and Robin's already alluded to it you know we 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 have contractors all over the country um, when you put a weather station out we, we send contractors out that follow very strict guidelines and, and regulations on how we, how those stations are set up. We maintain them, um, calibrate them. And the MedOp Center up in Burnsville, Minnesota, we have an entire wall board of the map of US and Canada, and, and it'll be globally at one point. But um, currently there's a wall board up there as soon as each weather station is active, there is a light that will appear on that map in that in the MedOps room. And we monitor, we have, uh, like Riven said earlier, over 270 meteorologists on staff. They work 24 hours a day, seven days a week on shifts. And we have an average tenure of about 10 years for these meteorologists. In, the, in that world, there's they they call them certified meteorology meteorologists there's only a handful of these people in the world and we have four full-time 
uh, certified meteorologists on staff. And what it does is they, they sit down in like in the, in over Nebraska, a group of people monitor weather trends, historic and forecasting. And with all the DTN uh, algorithms and interpolations that we do um, is what, what you're getting access to through this. And so the, if the, if the station is deployed, there's a code on the map that they visual that they look at and it's it's red yellow and green green means they're active and everything's going right if a uh, if something were to happen on a on a station the system notifies it and it would turn it to yellow and then we have a team that goes active on that they would probably call rich and say hey there, there's a station that we might need to go look at if it if it's a color code of red, it means something's not right and we need to fix it. And so they're paying a lot of attention, you know, making sure that this data we're, we're giving you guys is, is good and monitoring it at all times. And so when they have the quality behind it and the support system is wonderful. And the stations that we put out, you know, wind and storms that come through, they're monitoring those things all the time because we're wanting to provide that good uh, data for you. Yep, Chad, and I have up here just a quick view of, of all the traps that we monitor and just on that red, green, and yellow, just kind of to kind of showcase that we have mm -hmm. monitoring out there and I can look at what's happening in those stations and then make effective calls mm -hmm. out to someone to say, look, you need to go out and take a look at that station. So uh, real-time monitoring. Mm -hmm. uh, we've got some guy, people that have already have DT and weather stations individual weather stations on the webinar, I believe. What would be an advantage to them of joining this network versus just having an individual station out there? And what's the advantage of having setting this network up here in this area? Well, uh, I can jump in here. Um, an individual weather station is, is I mean, obviously it's, it's good because um, it's going to give you some field level information. Uh, but when you're getting inside of a network, um, it's going to give you a, a much more broad base data set. So the, the, uh, the decisions, the forecasts that are coming in um, from I mean, storms moving from wet west or, or west to east, um, I'm getting forecasts uh, of areas that are uh, a little bit away from me. And it, it allows me, my weather station, to become more accurate because now I'm getting a lot more data a lot of more interpolated data that's going to plug into that weather station and allow me to have a better forecast and then you plug in the that trap information and some of the economic impact type information as well um, it's going to give me just a lot more not just data to play with uh, but a lot more uh, tools to make decisions off of um, by getting into a more um, larger network uh, instead of just an individual a specific network <clears throat> yeah it's kind of like one way to look at it too would be uh, around like soil sampling in a, in a one way to look at it statistical uh, view of it if you do composite sampling versus grid sampling at the end of the day the more data that's being analyzed and collected the more accurate it is and that's kind of way the model works with this <clears throat> provide some advantage in that way. Yep, absolutely. Yep. Very, very useful as a standalone, but powerful together. And when you put that with a, an insect a trapping network that you set up, uh, DT smart traps along with your delta traps, uh, you've got a two pronged approach of the weather and, and insect pressure out there. So you can see those, um, those patterns and those movements out there so you can make the most uh, up-to-date uh, decision out there, whereas in before, you're pulling from one or two or some other localized information, now you have real information coming in, you can make those decisions. Yep. And irrigation, I, we, know, we know is very important, and uh, the product manager that we have over um, DTNAP um, is based out of the office where Jason is in West Lafayette, and he has got a very uh, sound background in meteorology and agriculture. 
and and he's got a lot of uh, passion to put some emphasis on our irrigation tools in the future. We got good information now. We just want to keep making it better uh, in those areas. And we won't mention that he's a Penn State grad because that's that's not good to hear around Purdue country. So, but anyway, <laughs> or Nebraska country? You kidding me? Uh, that's true. That's true. You know. Uh, it's funny that he's sitting in, in Purdue University uh, Research Park and he has Penn State stuff in his office. I keep telling him to watch out, so. <laughs> he better. <laughs> <clears throat> well, cool. Uh, any other questions uh, have come up, Rich? Uh, any, any more uh, feedback or, yeah, or anything? I'll just jump in real quick. Cool. Well, at any point that yeah, yeah. somebody wanted to go through um, different parts of the AP or the smart traps, we just covered a, a high level of view, but uh, just let us know. We can sit down with you and go through uh, specific questions. Uh, deploying the, the, the uh, DT smart trap is extremely easy. You just charge it up. We have a, a new system involved with that. And once you charge your trap for the season, then you put it out. Those traps are going to last for the better part of the growing season when you need to be um, tracking uh, insect pressure. And it's pretty simple. You go out, you associate the trap to a field. Uh, it has to be within those uh, field boundaries for that trap to actually start to, uh, to see where it's at. Uh, but when you put it out there in the field, it's going to associate itself with that. And then once you place it within that boundary out there, um, it will go through the process of calling up into the to the cloud to the different cell phone carriers. We work with a lot of different carriers. We actually have one where we pick the strongest signal, plug it in so that you're getting that information back right away. And so that trap, once it's online, you leave it out there. The only thing you need to do is change the picky cards and the lures. And if something's going wrong with the trap, maybe somebody hit it. We had somebody last year mowing the edge of the field and he mowed over a, a smart trap, which wasn't very good but uh, we were able to identify issues quickly and get another trap out there. So um, in case that's a question you may have, deploying a trap and then maintaining a trap is really, really easy. Yep. Yep, and, and, um, and I also note this. I mean, we went through a lot of information here, um, a lot of different tools. The, the biggest thing to note is um, during the setup, we'll, 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 we'll be hand-in-hand -hand during setup and we'll also make sure you're comfortable with the tools. So um, the biggest thing to note is that there's great tools out here. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll teach you how to use them and we'll get you comfortable on how to use them. So um, when you're in the field making decisions, um, you can kind of feel confident in, in what you're doing and how to do it. And if you have any questions, um, we, we always have a good support team to um, help you through those questions and get you, um, get you back on uh, back on the uh on the decision train i guess but <clears throat> but cool um well if if there's any other questions please uh please let me know otherwise we can uh we've gone a little bit over um on time so i apologize for that but um if you have any questions let me know otherwise you can reach out to me or, or rich and uh we can uh, address them from there um otherwise we'll uh we'll let you guys go thanks for your time again and uh we look forward to uh, talking with you soon. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.